so today's message is John chapter 10, and we're going to be in verse 3 to 6. And the title is The Good Shepherd, part two, How a Shepherd Leads. Now, I usually cover more scripture as we go through the whole gospel of John, but I do believe the Lord wants us to slow down here in John 10 and really dig into the profound teachings about who Jesus is as our good shepherd and how we can discern shepherds around us. So let's read the whole passage, just get the whole picture. John chapter 10 and verse 1, read along with me. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. And let's read ahead a little bit. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John chapter 10 comes with two major questions we can ask ourselves and and explore together. What kind of leader was Jesus? And how do we discern spiritual leaders today, whether they're really representing God or not? Quick review from last week, we did dive into the introduction to this theme in the first two verses. The Bible likens us to sheep who need a shepherd. The fact that the Bible calls you and I sheep is not a burn, it's actually a blessing. (laughs) When David said, the Lord is my shepherd, he was bragging on the power of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord, saying he's my shepherd. It's a bit like pet owners today. There are good pet owners and there are bad pet owners. Think of dogs especially. One of our neighbors, uh, when we lived in Calgary a few years ago, uh, they had a big German shepherd And they neglected this dog. They frustrated this dog. And it was cooped up in a small house in a small yard. And uh, it was definitely looking for more uh, something, attention, places to run, places to go. Sometimes it would stay up all night and bark through the night in in the yard really loud while the owners were, I don't know what, they were ignoring it. (laughs) Raise your hand if you own a pet in some way. Yeah. You guys are the good pet owners, right? Because you go to Calvary Chapel, right? <laughs> the people for uh, the bad pet owners, they go to that other church down the street. <laughs> Just kidding. But you know, God is like the good owner of, of us as sheep. And the Bible calls us sheep who need a shepherd. And you know, if you were, let's imagine for a moment you're a dog. And there's two, two options. You can either go with the really bad owner who's going to neglect you, or you can go to the owner who's going to baby you and just look after every detail. Which one would you choose? You go to the good owner, right? And that's what David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And it's a good thing that we have a shepherd. We can say we need one and we have one. The Bible also likens God to a shepherd who loves sheep. We are the sheep of his pasture. And we're blessed to have a God who made us and also loves us. And there's no greater love than the love that God has for us. God is a good, loving shepherd. The Bible also likens spiritual leaders to shepherds. We talked about this last week, Jeremiah 3.15. He said, I will give you shepherds according to my heart, said God, and I will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So a true shepherd from God has God's heart, speaks God's truth, and empowers God's people to succeed. And many spiritual leaders in Israel's history, as we studied last time, they were not true shepherds. They were false shepherds. Jeremiah said they became dull-hearted, and then they fleeced the flock. They looked only for themselves. And this brings us to the context of John 10, because Jesus is contrasting himself with the Pharisees. 
You remember in John chapter 9, the man who was born blind and Jesus healed him. He believed in Jesus. And then he was cast out of the synagogue. He was excommunicated by the so-called spiritual leaders who did not like the fact that they were losing control over their people. Jesus, of course, being the master teacher, used word pictures that everyone was familiar with, and he used the idea of sheep and the shepherd. In those days, everyone saw that and knew what that was. And so now Jesus uses an illustration in John 10 to contrast himself as the good shepherd with the Pharisees who were the false shepherds. Now, we introduced our outline for this series last week, five marks of a shepherd. And the first one was how they enter the sheepfold. That was back in verse 1 and 2. Let's read those again. Look at it closely. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same, same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus used this picture of a sheepfold. We can bring up that picture again. It was a pen to keep the sheep safe. The walls were too high for the sheep to get out and difficult for thieves to get in and steal. And one shepherd at nighttime could just stay there in the doorway, guarding all the sheep while the other shepherds went home and had a good night's sleep. Now, let me unlock another layer of this teaching that I didn't really get into for time's sake last week. What is the sheepfold in Jesus' illustration? What is the sheepfold? What does it represent? Some have said maybe the sheepfold represents heaven and Jesus lets us into heaven. That's not actually accurate because it says thieves can break in and steal. That's not a very comforting picture of heaven, is it? <laughs> so maybe it's salvation. Maybe it's being in a church. No, because it says they go in and out and they're finding pasture and, and they don't stay there. So I think the story here that Jesus is describing is that the good shepherd, as he leads them out of the field, is how Jesus brings his sheep out of Israel, out of Judaism. That's the context. Because remember John chapter 9, there's a guy who's just been kicked out of Judaism. And Jesus is saying, I'm the good shepherd. He's going to follow me now because he believes. And so Jesus is starting a new sheep fold, a new flock called disciples, believers in Christ. And when we get down to verse 16, Jesus is going to say he has another uh, sheepfold where he brings out more people into the flock, and that's speaking of the Gentiles. We'll get to that further on. But this is in the first six verses, very much in the context of Israel and Jesus leading the sheep out to follow him, out of religion into relationship, out of the old covenant into the new covenant. And the context here of this man formerly born uh, blind is now saved. He's now believing in Christ. He's put his faith in Jesus. And Jesus is illustrating that he is that good shepherd. The Pharisees, they were the thieves and the robbers who hopped into the spiritual leadership of Israel illegitimately. Look at the uh, graphic we can put up on the screen. Jesus was teaching that thieves and robbers enter illegitimately Whereas he, the true shepherd, entered in the right way, entered through the door. And you can see the practical um, application to that. The Pharisees came through political connections, manipulation, ambition, corruption, and they were like thieves and robbers. Whereas Jesus is coming in literally through the front door, through God's calling, through the fulfillment of scripture. He fulfilled all those prophecies about the Messiah. And the way he loved, the way he cared, the way he sacrificed himself for the sheep showed he was a true shepherd. He was the true shepherd of Israel, coming in the right way. And so we talked last week how we can discern one of the ways we can discern if a leader is really from God, representing God today, is do they literally live for the benefit of the sheep or for the benefit of themselves? And it's a real simple application. Is a shepherd looking to build others up or to gain something for himself? So today we continue in our outline. And the next part, and I'll just show you the whole view of where we're going here, how a shepherd enters the sheepfold, but also how a shepherd then leads the sheep. That's what we're going to talk about today. 
A true shepherd will lead rather than drive the sheep. We'll get into that. A true shepherd will protect the sheep and will feed the sheep and will love the sheep. We'll talk about those coming up in the coming weeks. So for today, verse three to six, how a shepherd leads the sheep. And look at verse three. It says to him, that's to the real shepherd, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. So Jesus is developing his word picture of a sheepfold. Now, most shepherds in Jesus' day, they didn't have large flocks. They weren't big corporate corporate owners. Perhaps they owned 10 sheep, maybe 20 sheep. And so a pen could hold a lot more, and each village pretty much had a pen or a, a sheepfold. And Jesus is describing how those village sheepfolds were like a communal uh, cooperative arrangement. And so you remember the purpose of bringing in all the sheep into the sheepfold is safety, particularly at night when the threat of thieves and robbers and predators was higher. And so most of the shepherds could then go home at night while one or two hired men called gatekeepers or doorkeepers would guard the doorway or the entrance, sometimes even a shepherd himself. And so they would all bring their sheep into this one communal pen for safety at night. And when the sheep are in the sheepfold, do they sit down in ranks in their little groups? (laughs) No. You know what sheep do. They just mingle around. They just socialize together. They just hang out together for the night and do sheep things. I don't know. They they get to know each other. (laughs) And when the morning comes, then... The individual shepherds start showing up at the, at the doorway of the sheepfold. And so here's the question. How do you separate the sheep back into their flocks? How do you get the right sheep with the right shepherd? Now, in those days, they didn't brand sheep. And actually today, you still don't brand sheep. They also didn't tag sheep, like today there's often a tag on an ear or they use a colored spray paint on the wool. But in those days, they actually, in the Middle East, they had an even better and more efficient solution, especially with smaller um, flocks. And that is that the shepherd would build this long-term relationship with the sheep because sheep weren't primarily for food. It was primarily for the wool. And so they would live for many years. Sometimes a shepherd would know his sheep for 20 years, 30 years. And so sheep, they had plenty of time to build a personal connection with the shepherd. And one of the strengths that a sheep has is their hearing. And so when the shepherd just enters the pen and makes his unique call or his whistle, his sheep instantly recognize his voice, they know his voice, and they're drawn to the safety of that familiar voice who they trust, and they will excitedly come to him and walk out of the pen, while the other sheep will shy away into the back corner of the pen. You see, sheep don't willingly go with a stranger or an unfamiliar voice. They shy away. But they will gladly go with the shepherd that they've learned to trust. Now look at verse 3 again. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse four, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and his sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. So Jesus is describing some fascinating insights here into the kind of leader, the kind of shepherd that he was. So we can talk today about how a shepherd leads. And the first principle is that a shepherd, a true shepherd, does not drive his sheep, but he leads them. Notice that in verse 3. You might want to underline it. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. It doesn't say he drives them out. It says he leads them out. And verse 4, he brings out his own sheep and goes before them, and they follow him willingly, is the point. You see, cattle need to be driven, but sheep are better to be led. Now, in in our Western culture, often with bigger flocks, shepherds will drive the sheep. They'll get a sheepdog or two or a quad or something, and they'll drive those sheep from one pen to the next where they need to go. 
But in the Middle East, when they had the smaller flocks, they got to know them over years. All they had to do was make a little clicking sound or a whistle or make their call. I won't do a, an impression because <laughs> it would be awful. But they just make their little sound and the sheep would recognize the voice and just follow the shepherd. There's a story in World War I just outside Jerusalem how some soldiers tried to steal a flock of sheep while their shepherd was sleeping. And as they were making off with the sheep, trying to drive them away, the shepherds or shepherd woke up and he, all he had to do was step out from where he was and just call with his regular call. And all those sheep turned around and came back to him. And the soldiers couldn't control them and the soldiers lost. <laughs> There's another story in Australia of a man who was accused of stealing his neighbor's sheep. And he insisted that these are my sheep. I didn't steal them. They're mine. And they had a court case and they listened to all the evidence. And then at the end of the case, the judge said, let's bring in the last witness, the sheep. <laughs> As it literally happened. And the sheep came in and then the judge said, call your sheep. And he called and they did not go to him. And then the other guy who was saying, no, they're my sheep. He called and they all went over to him. And the judge said, the sheep know their shepherd's voice. Just like this passage. Do you know what it's like to have Jesus call your name? To have Jesus reach into your heart, into your spirit and call you to follow him. To come out of some other sheepfold, to come out of the world, to come out of empty religion and to have a personal relationship with him. Many of you are nodding and humming and umming right now. Yes, I do. <laughs> he calls you and I personally to salvation with his love and with his truth. And he draws us individually, even by name. The Bible says that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And Jesus will confess your name before his father and before the angels. He knows your name and he calls you by name. In my own life, it was through emptiness of idols and, and things in the world that I looked to to fill me. And God opened my eyes, and I really understood that when he died on the cross, he died for me, and he took away all of the wretched sin of my, that I've committed and that I ever will, and that he's calling me now to trust him. And I, I responded to that. And I said, yes, Lord, have my life. I fully surrendered to him, to him as a 16-year-old. And it changed the rest of my life because now I could sense that substance I was missing was there in Jesus Christ. And I want to know him more every day. Jesus called me by name and I put my life in his hands and now I get to live for him. And at the same time, he wasn't just calling me to salvation, but to really follow him, to really read his word and pray and know him. And I've been following that call because it's the best thing there that there is going. Sometimes I get into some other hobby, a sport, a game, some other possession or, or project, but it, it always leaves me empty compared to just really drawing close in my relationship with Jesus. That's what satisfies. And there's a spiritual call that God is putting to each one of you. Maybe you've already responded to that. Maybe you haven't, or maybe you've walked away from it. But know that the Lord is calling you simply to put your trust your faith in him and to live for him and seek him with all your heart. That's why he's calling you through different trials, different emptiness, different circumstances in your life. And even as a believer, he continues to call us to a deeper surrender. I remember when he called me to um, step out in a church plant and to get out from my comfort zone of being a, a youth pastor in Calgary and go on the mission field to Regina. And I remember seeking the Lord and praying, and he was just calling me. And I, I wasn't like, yeah, I want to go live in Regina. It was just like, no, the Lord's calling me to go and to, to serve his people. And then I mentioned to Megan that I was praying about fully surrendering and maybe going out on the mission. And she didn't like it at first, but I just knew God's, if God's in it, he's, gonna, he's her shepherd too. I don't have to tell her. She's going to hear from the Lord. And she went and prayed and sought the Lord. And it wasn't long after when she came and said, the Lord's speaking to me about this too. See, he's a good shepherd. And when we're listening to him, we can join together in unity in different 
ways in our families, in our church, because we're listening to one shepherd. And Megan also sensed that call, calling us both by name to join together out here to Saskatchewan. And then people say, why on earth did you move to Regina? And we say, well, the Lord <laughs> called us. And if they don't know the Lord, they're like, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Something. <laughs> so what's the Lord calling you to right now? Is it to salvation, to trusting? Is it to a deeper surrender, to a deeper faith and trust in him in some circumstance? Follow him. He's calling you by name. A true shepherd. Here's the second principle. Let's go on to the next one. A true shepherd cares for every one of his sheep. That's why it says he knows us by name. You're not just a number to God. You're not just, you know, Costco-sized Christianity. Let's get more numbers. No, no. It's you are an individual who he cares for. He knows every thought you have before you think it. He's numbered every hair on your head. He knows you and he loves you. And Jesus calls individuals to follow. In John, we've seen Nathaniel follow Jesus. We've seen Nicodemus called by name following Jesus. We've seen the woman at the well, the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda, the blind man now in chapter 9, called by name. And then they follow Jesus. And Jesus loved each one individually, met them where they were at, and brought them to who they were really meant to be as they followed him. And Jesus knows you and me. You know, a few years ago, one of the Calvary Chapel churches in Europe owned a castle, and they used it for pastor's conferences and retreats and other ministries. And there was a bunch of um, international conferences there, and a few pastors from the States who I know went out to Austria and while they were there, they're, they're in the hill country. Just picture the sound of music. And they go for a nice walk, and they run into a shepherd with, he had eight sheep with him. And they just stopped to talk to him. He didn't know they were pastors. And they're, they're meeting a, a real-life shepherd with the little flock following. And, and they said, well, tell us about what, what your sheep. And he said, oh, yeah. And he started telling them the names of each of the sheep. <laughs> this one's Gertrude. And this one's Heidi, and this one's Hilda. And, and, and then he, the shepherd would say, and they, you know, they all have personalities. You know, Gertie over here, if I don't yell at her, she won't listen. But, but Bertie over here, if I do yell at her, she won't even look at me for the rest of the day. And, and he's just, you know what it's like with your pets or even with if you've had, you know, kids. They're, like, they're so different from each other. Their personalities are so unique. That's what Jesus is saying. I know my sheep. I know each one by name. And I know how to call you. I know how to speak to you. And so we can pray, Lord, if that's true, speak to me in a way I can understand. And he will. He will answer that prayer. He will make his will clear in your life because he knows you and he knows the way you process. He knows the way you think. We're all so different. I was out at camp for the week. Everyone out there, very different from each other. The way they process, the way they handle things, the way they interact. And sometimes you're with people so much it can be a little bit, yeah, we need a break. <laughs> but the Lord isn't like that with us. He looks at you and he says, I want to be with you. I know you. I care about you. I can handle the way you are and process. I made you this way and I'll speak to you and I'll stay with you all the time because he's your good shepherd. So how does Jesus lead us? He leads us uniquely and individually. And our part is to listen to his voice and then to willingly follow our shepherd. That's the application. That's the biggest one today. Are you listening to his voice? And are you following what he says? And the more we stop resisting God, the more we willingly follow him, the closer and more intimate our relationship with our shepherd will be. And the more... Clearly, we will hear his voice on a day-to-day -day basis, and the closer that walk will be with him. Now, you might say, well, Colin, how do we discern God's voice? Well, there are three or four different voices always speaking. So, so it's like, how do we discern? Is this voice I'm thinking or this idea that's in my mind or this pressure I'm feeling, is it from God or is it from Satan or is it from just myself my flesh, my old nature, or some other person's flesh? How do we discern when it's really God speaking to us? 
And it's important that we do. Well, let me answer the question. I'm gonna give you five different answers real quick. You can maybe take a picture on the screen if you want as it, as it develops. The first way is God speaks to us through his word, not through our feelings. Psalm 119 puts it like this, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And Hebrews chapter four says, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. That means what's from the Lord and what's from myself. And of joints and marrow, the, the sword of the word of God can, can divide. And it says it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So be in the word of God and your thoughts will be, you'll be able to discern, is that from the Lord? Is that just from me? Is that soul or is that the Holy Spirit working in, in my spirit? See, this book here is inspired by God. Every word is given to us by the breath of God. And this is the primary way to know the shepherd's voice, is to spend time daily reading his word. Secondly, I would say God also speaks to us through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 30 illustrates this. He says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. He's talking about this new covenant relationship where the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and is able to speak to us. The other day, uh, actually last Sunday, and Jeff, you're here, so I'm going to embarrass you slightly. <laughs> but I went out for a prayer walk in the morning, and I had my Apple headphones on, and I just upgraded my phone, so I didn't realize there was a new setting. And as I'm listening to worship music and as I'm praying, suddenly Siri jumps in and says, Jeff has texted you, <laughs> and then read out the text. And it was just like, as I'm walking, here's the voice telling me about the day and what's coming up and how I can pray. And it was awesome. And then it stopped and went back to worship. I didn't even touch anything. I was like, that's, that's crazy. I'm new to those techie things <laughs> sometimes. But the point is, you'll hear a voice speaking to you, and it's the Lord. How do you discern if that is the Lord speaking to you? Or if it's just <laughs> Siri? <laughs> you can discern because you're in the Word of God often. And, and when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, hey, here's a nudge, here's an impression, Pray for that person, or something's up here. You need to, to take a moment with that person, ask them how they're doing. That's the Holy Spirit often. We've got to become sensitive to that, listening to that voice. When we're in the word of God, it will happen more. When we're close to our shepherd. And as we grow in our walk with God, we discover obeying those impressions and those thoughts, we can discern quickly, oh, that was just me, or that really was the Lord. And we'll see the fruit of it. It'll be obvious later down the road and the Lord will guide us. Maybe you get an impression or a feeling, oh, God is calling me to date a, an unbeliever. Well, hold on a minute. Contradiction to the word of God. That's not the Holy Spirit speaking. That's why we need to be in the word of God. And there's many other examples I could give, but the point is the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. Romans chapter eight, verse 14 says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so we need to learn the voice of God. And it's a lifelong pursuit. No human has mastered it, but you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and he's gonna help you. And so you are his sheep. If you're a believer in Christ, you will recognize his voice more and more as you grow in your relationship with him. And you'll follow his lead more clearly day by day as you grow and as you take steps of faith, as you step out of your comfort zone. Oh, I think the Lord's just telling me to put my feet up for the whole summer and just rest and just not do anything serving at all. Well, hold on a minute. Is that really the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking? <laughs> or <laughs> someone said yes. <laughs> well, maybe for the summer, but when the fall comes, I don't know. The Holy Spirit might have something else for you, my friend. <laughs> just kidding. But the point is, you'll get to know the, the voice of the Lord and you'll discern what's, what's the flesh as you're in the word, as you're listening and praying, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me. But also, there's other ways that can confirm whether the, the word of God and the Holy Spirit is speaking. Another way is that you'll have a peace that comes through prayer, Colossians 3.15. Another way is that you'll have wise counselors that you bring into your life, Proverbs 24.6. It says, by wise counsel, wage war. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Invite mature believers into your life and say, this is what I think God's leading me to do. Am I crazy? 
And if they really love you and trust you, then, then you know what, maybe they'll say, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> or maybe they'll say, no, that sounds like what I was reading in the word of God. That sounds like this story of this guy in the Bible. And, and oh yeah, the Holy Spirit can confirm his will through brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we need fellowship. That's why we need to be in the body. And then also through open and closed doors, Acts chapter 16, the Holy Spirit stopped Paul going to uh, the area of Ephesus in, in Asia Minor, just forbid him, just shut the door because he wanted him to go over to Europe. And so sometimes the Lord closes the door and you can say, Lord, you must be gonna open, you're, you're gonna open some other door in my life. Tune in, listen, draw close to him because he wants to lead you and guide you. God wants us to hear his voice and his leading more and more. And this happens when we humbly seek him. You've got Psalm 25. Let's go there and we'll kind of end our time. Well, no, we'll come back to John. Keep your finger in John. And then we'll just look in uh, Psalm 25. You see, this happens to those who humbly seek him. Psalm 25 verse 4 says, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Verse five, lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Go down to verse eight, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he teaches sinners in the way, those who are humble enough to admit, Lord, I don't get it. I am a rotten sinner, but would you teach me? Yes, says the Lord, I will teach you. Verse nine, the humble he guides in justice. The humble he teaches his way. Verse 12, who is the man who fears the Lord? Him he shall teach in the way he chooses. This is learning the voice of our shepherd, guys. It's being humble. Verse 13, he himself shall dwell in prosperity. His descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. And he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. He shall pluck my feet out of the net. Are you seeking the Lord humbly and desperately? He will speak to you. He will guide you. You will know the voice of your shepherd as you're in the word, as you're listening to the Holy Spirit, and as you bring in those counselors and, and seek the Lord's wisdom and look for those, that peace of God and those open and closed doors. God will confirm his will. I believe the will of God is the hardest thing for a Christian to miss if we're really just seeking him. We have to be patient. He doesn't reveal it all in two minutes, but God wants to reveal it as we progressively seek him more and more. So let's go back to John and we'll, we'll end, I think, there in John chapter 10. We didn't really get into verse 4 because there's another principle here. And when he brings out his own sheep, verse 4, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. So here's another principle of how a shepherd leads. He goes before the sheep. He doesn't like send the sheep out in front to, to look for the wolves. <laughs> He goes first. He leads by caring for them. He doesn't hide behind them. He forges the path. He risks his neck for their safety. Think about Jesus. How did he do that? How did he go before us? Well, he took the heavy hits so we could be saved. He defeated sin and death in the grave. We don't have to. We just hide in him. And he's already led. He's already gone before us. He's already defeated the power of Satan. And we don't have to in our own power. We can just hide in, in Christ. And you are in Christ if you believe. He's gone before you. Your shepherd has led the way. So we can follow in Jesus. How comforting it is to walk in that victory. Not for victory, but, but in the victory of Christ. He's already won it. We're not fighting for victory, but from victory. Because he's already gone before us. And when you're going through a difficult circumstance in your life, he's already gone before you. And he's ready to meet you there and give you the grace that you need in that moment that you've never experienced before, that much grace. He's going to give it to you in that way for that trial because he's going before you because he's a good shepherd. And then one more principle, a true shepherd also leads by example. The Pharisees were saying, do what we say, not what we do. Jesus, he came and he served people. He took the towel, he washed stinky feet, and then he said, I've given you an example do to others as I've done to you. So Jesus goes before us, showing us the example of the path of life. Jesus is the true shepherd. He goes before us, his sheep follow him, we know his voice and we trust that his path is right. Even though we don't know where we're going, we trust that he has a plan, 
He has a purpose. Let's look down at verse 5 and 6. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. So the Pharisees, they didn't care for people, certainly not by name. They didn't have a clue who this blind beggar was who was apparently in their congregation all those years. They didn't know him. They didn't care for him. Jesus went after him and found him and knew him by name. In verse 6, it says that Jesus used this illustration, but the people there didn't understand. So then Jesus will explain more, and we'll get into that soon. But this is such a profound, it's a simple picture, shepherd and a sheep, but there's so many layers to this of theology and application to our lives, to our walk with the Lord and to our roles of leadership. And you guys, I think verse 6 is really saying the Pharisees were the ones who who truly, they would never understand this. They couldn't get it because their hearts were closed. Their hearts were not open. Those who will follow Christ, they'll understand in time. Even John will write this out for us, understanding what it means. And so too, as we seek the Lord, we'll understand. We'll understand as well as we keep seeking him. So in summary, here's how a shepherd leads. He doesn't drive the sheep, but he leads them. He cares for every single one. He goes before the sheep and he leads by example. And we could talk, we could actually start another sermon <laughs> on how that applies to leadership in the church, those principles. You can, you can kind of layer them over what you see in leadership. And you know what? Jesus is going to expand on how this works. Let's bring up the full outline again. We'll get into this next week a true shepherd leads by protecting, by feeding, and by loving. And Jesus is going to explain all of that. So next time we'll talk more application. Question for you today. Do you know God's voice? Are you listening to God's voice? We often have trouble. Why? Is it because God stopped talking? Because the shepherd stopped calling? No, it's because we're not listening. We're not spending that time. We're not seeking him. There was a man who was having a hard time communicating with his wife, and he concluded that she must be having hearing problems. So he tried a test. He sat on the opposite side of the room while she was sitting facing the other way, and he tried an experiment. Hey, honey, can you hear me? No response. So he came into the middle of the room. Hey, honey, can you hear me? Still no response. So he went real close, right up behind her, and said directly to her, Hey, can you hear me now? And she said, For the third time, I said yes. <laughs> Some of you are nudging your spouse right now. He thought she had the hearing problem, but it was actually him. And you know, it's the same with the Lord, isn't it? God... Can't you hear me? God, where are you? God, why aren't you speaking to me? Well, hold on, are you really listening? Because his sheep will hear his voice. They will know his voice and they will follow him as he leads you in paths of righteousness. Psalm 23 says he leads you beside the still waters. He makes you sit down. He makes you rest. He leads you where you can be refreshed. He restores your soul and he leads you in paths of righteousness. And even when you go through a valley like a shadow of death, hey, he's there with you, comforting you, guiding you with his rod and his staff. Do you have that close walk with the Lord? You know what you do? This is the good news. I'm not telling you, you gotta work real hard on getting spiritual and mystical in your life. I'm saying you already have a good shepherd who loves you and knows you and speaks to you the way you will understand if you're listening. If you take time and say, Lord, speak to me in ways I can get it, and then take a few moments to read his word, to pray, and then listen to the nudgings, listen to the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and talk about what God's teaching you with friends who, who are mature in Christ and growing in Christ. And you will know the voice of your shepherd, he'll lead you out, and especially out of those old folds of religion that's dead and of, 
of the world. He'll bring you out to walk with him and then to follow him in every step. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much that you are our leader, our shepherd, and that you care about us, that you know everything that we're going through right now. In fact, you care about it. You have more thoughts toward us than the number of grains of sand in the whole world. And that's how much you're thinking and caring about us. Even when humans let us down, Lord, you never ever do. And thank you, Lord, that you are such a good shepherd. You lead us and you guide us and you confirm your will. And we can know with confidence that we're growing closer to you, that we're following your path and that you're guiding us to those places of rest and restoration. And Lord, you won't lead us to um, comfort zones, but you will restore our soul. And we can follow you and know that you're going to do that and believe and receive. So Lord, help my brothers and sisters here, help us to abide close with you, to willingly listen and willingly follow and not resist and use us more and more in the sheepfold, Lord, amongst the flock and even in the world as we shine bright. Use us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.